amazing. We're in a collection of talks that we're calling Starting the Decade Right. It's not just a new year, it's a new decade. And I don't know about you, but I believe it's an unprecedented era where we're going to step into the greatest decade of ministry planet Earth has ever seen. I believe we live in an opportune time where we have situations and circumstances, we have technology, we have all things that God has given us so that he can move in a way that he has never done before. I say that in faith, I also say that in confidence because I, I, I see the signs. The, uh, the Bible talks us how we should be aware of the signs of the times and what's going on, and things are getting pretty crazy out there. I don't know if you noticed, but uh, I believe God is going to do some amazing amazing things. So in this collection of talks, we've been talking about how do we position ourselves to start the decade right so that we can have an amazing 2020, so that we can have an amazing decade. It's a problem-free philosophy is what we talked about week one, if you remember, and uh, I just challenge you to look at problems different. God's promises come with problems, and that's okay because there's a purpose behind every problem. We don't have to be afraid of them. We don't have to do what our human nature suggests and just run away from problems, right? And just hide and try to avoid pain. No, we can face them head on because we understand that those problems have a purpose. And if I want the promises of God, it's gonna come with some problems. So we're not afraid of problems, right? We're all good, we're, all, we're confident, we're full of faith, we're bold. That was like the least popular message I've ever preached, how to deal with problems. It's like, yay. <laughs> Got like two views on YouTube, so that was amazing. Hello to my YouTube friends. But uh, last week we talked about this idea of anointing. Anybody enjoy last week's message? I enjoyed teaching last week's me message. It's this word in the Bible that literally means to be covered or smeared with oil, but in our era it means that the Holy Spirit is not only on you, but working within you to accomplish a specific purpose. And we talked about how we are anointed. If you've placed your faith in Jesus, you are anointed. You're looking very anointed today, by the way, as I look out there. Some very anointed looking faces. Very anointed. You know who was anointed last night? It was Conor McGregor. 40 seconds is all he needed, and the cowboy went down. Anyway, another message for another day. But uh, <laughs> if you're into UFC, you know what I'm talking about. If you don't, moving along. Today, I want to talk to you about this idea and this ability called power to change things. Power to change things. Would you pray with me before we unpack that? Jesus, we thank you that you have all power, that you are not just a distant God, far off, kind of waiting for us to figure things out, God, but you promised to be near. And so, Holy Spirit, we invite you into this room, into our hearts. We open up our minds to hear from heaven today. And God, we give you credit for what you want to accomplish in advance, in Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. amen. Today I want to talk to you about how there are different kinds of prayers. And that I think a lot of us know, if you're a Christian, if you're a Jesus follower, that we should pray. That prayer is effective, that God is a good God and he wants to answer the prayers of his kids. But a little survey, if you are in the camp where you would say, I believe in prayer, but I just, I kind of feel like I should pray more than I do. Would you be honest and just raise your hand? I feel like I should be praying more. Look at all the hands, all the hands, all the hands. We all feel this way, right? I feel like I should pray more. I don't pray often enough. And I think there's some very good reasons why. Some of us honestly just don't know how to pray well. I think that some of us, if we're honest, we get bored while we pray. Don't raise your hand on that. <laughs> I think we get easily distracted, right? Sometimes I'm praying for a miracle, and I'm like, miracle whip? No, nah, I prefer mayo. Oh, I haven't had a BLT in a long time. What am I going to have for lunch today? Hmm. Oh, yeah, prayer. I'm back to prayer. Right, all right. <laughs> I remember when I was a kid, I grew up in church, and we would have prayer groups where everybody would get in a circle and hold hands. I don't know if you've ever been a part of these. I don't particularly love this. It's kind of weird to me because uh, sometimes you don't know what that person has touched. And so uh, maybe I'm a little bit of a germaphobe, but I seem to always get the guy who is like the overgripper. You know what I mean? Like the prayer would kind of get a little more intense, and so would the grip. It's just getting tighter and tighter, and I'm like, that ain't going to get more stuff done, bro. Like, just relax. <laughs> and then oftentimes, on the other hand, it was like dead fish hand, you know, just sweaty, kind of, yeah, you know what I'm talking about, just clammy, and it's just one of these. And I'm like, come on, like... Give me something here. And it's just, I didn't like it. I don't like holding hands with people that I don't know. And uh, maybe you do, and that's cool. But we, we don't do that here. Uh, let's be honest. Prayer 
can be weird. If you don't know how to pray, if you're foreign to the idea, it can be intimidating. Um, have you ever been in a prayer group where it just seems like Abraham's brother is praying and they're just like calling out promises of God and Lord, we beseech thee because your word says in Isaiah 64, 11. I'm like, what? I didn't even know there were 64 chapters in Isaiah. Like seriously? And just calling down promises of God and you're just like, how do I? Like I'm not God, but if I was, I would answer his prayer because that was good. <laughs> and it's a little intimidating, right? It can be like, I don't know how to pray like that. I just, I don't. <laughs> when I was a new believer and I was, I have a little bit of a competitive nature for those who know me. Uh, you shouldn't be competitive with prayer, by the way. You shouldn't. But I was. And <laughs> I would be in prayer meetings and there'd be the guys, you know, just like declaring the word and praying promises and just, they had this eloquence about them. And I would be like, God, you said in your word, Jehovah Nisan, you're good. Good to the last drop. Your word is so good, it melts in my mouth, not in my hands. It's finger licking good, it is, and uh, so good, I never leave home without it. Your word, and I was just trying to think of like everything in my mind that I have heard. I would say stupid things like, your word quenches my soul, so I obey my thirst. And uh, God, <laughs> You're so good. You're like a good neighbor. You'll always be there. <laughs> Your kingdom's the happiest place on earth. And uh, I want to go there. Your Holy Spirit energizes. It just keeps going and going and going and going. And there's some things money can't buy, but for everything else, there's you, Lord. And so I would just like regurgitate these stupid slogans. And uh, you got to start somewhere, right? You got to start somewhere. I think that often we don't pray because we are afraid, we don't know how, and we, we commonly make some mistakes. A couple things I'd like to point out to you, two big prayer mistakes that we all probably do. Number one, our prayers are too small. We pray for these little things. Lord, would you give me traveling mercies today? And he's like, yeah, easy. Like, ask me for something big. <laughs> or Lord, would you bless this food? He's like, I've already blessed the food, but okay. Or you know, Lord, help me just make enough money just to pay the bills. He's like, ah, you're not thinking big enough. <laughs> the other thing I think we do is our prayers are too general. We kind of pray these blanket prayers, right? We go like, God bless this day. <laughs> He's like, I've blessed every day. Okay. Like we, we have these big kind of general statements. Lord, help me, uh, you know, help my work. And I'm not saying these are bad. I just think they're too small. I think they're too general. And we serve a God who says, all things are possible to those who believe. He says, if you will stand on faith, you can accomplish impossible things. Jesus said, I want you to speak to a what? A mountain, a huge obstacle, something that looks impossible, something that looks that it cannot be moved and speak to that thing and watch it be moved by the power of God. We serve a God who has an unlimited power source, who is full of faith and wants his kids to pray some big, faith-filled, specific prayers. I wonder if God is just sitting in heaven thinking, I wish you would ask me for more. I wish you would pray more specifically. Why? So that it's unmistakably me who moves. He wants prayers that give him all the glory. When I was in Bible college, I was believing and waiting for a wife. And I wrote a list of all the characteristics I wanted in a wife. I heard a message that said, hey, pray specific prayers. I was like, okay. And I listed out, can I tell you? Tara Nelson is who I listed out. I didn't realize it at the time. I listed out 17 different points. And how many of you know, I met Tara and she's like 29 out of the 17 things on my list. And God says, I'm going to meet every single thing on your list and then some. Because we serve the God of and then some. He wants you to get specific with your prayers. I put it like this. General prayers don't move God to specific actions. These big general prayers, they don't move God to move in very specific ways. God doesn't want to just show up in your life. Can I tell you this morning? He wants to show off. He wants his glory to be on full display in your life. How do we do that? We have to have some big prayers. We have to have some specific prayers. He has given us the power to change things, and I think many of us are underutilizing this power. 
I don't know about you, but I want to pray big, faith-filled, specific prayers that could only happen if God moves. Last year, we turned seven as a church, and I stood up here and I told you, this is going to be our greatest year of ministry to date. Can I tell you, I was a little nervous to say that because I was stepping out in faith. I was like, all right, God, I put it out there. Now, I prayed before I said that, and I really sought the Lord. I said, is this something that you want to do? And we believe in the number seven, and we believe that God is into it, and he wants to, he's building a foundation here. He wants to do more than he's done in the past. And so all of it aligned with his purposes, and I'm happy to tell you that year seven was our greatest year of ministry to date. Can I also tell you this? Yeah, we could cheer for that if you're going to cheer. No golf claps, please. <laughs> We're going to turn eight next month, guys. Turning eight and feeling great. And can I tell you that year eight is going to be our greatest year of ministry that we have ever seen at the Station Church. In Jesus' name. James says, we have not because we ask not. What is it you're asking God? Are they generic, kind of general, small prayers? Or are they big, faith-filled, specific prayers that give him all the glory if he were to answer them? There's a guy who is considered the father of the reformation of the church, where the church kind of broke away from Catholicism, and, and, and Martin Luther said, you know, there's, we got to get the Bible in the hands of every man, the common people. And, and it was a whole thing you should read about it. It's awesome. But he had a partner, an assistant named Frederick Myconius. In 1540, Frederick got sick. In fact, he was so sick, he was laying in his deathbed, he couldn't speak anymore, and the doctor said he's only got a few hours left to live. Martin Luther said, not on my watch. This is what he wrote. I command you in the name of God to live, because I still have need of you in the work of reforming the church. The Lord will never let me hear that you are dead, but will permit you to survive me. For this I am praying, because I seek only to glorify the name of God. What? <laughs> He's basically saying, oh, the doctors are saying you're about to die. It looks like you're about to die. You can't even talk. You're so sick. I command you to live in Jesus' name. You see the difference in the type of prayer here? I'm happy to report to you that Frederick went on to live for six more years. In fact, he outlived Martin Luther by a couple of months. <laughs> he didn't just ask God to do something. He declared it so. There is a different type of prayer I want to talk to you about that gives you the power to change things. There are good prayers that say, hey, God, will you bless me? Or God, will you protect? Or God, will you? I'm not saying those are bad. You should pray those prayers. The Bible talks how we should bring all of our petitions to God. But there's a different level of prayer. Can it get a little, a, a little 2.0 on you this morning? Can we go a little deeper in our faith that says, hey, I'm not just going to ask God and, and plead and you know, wait for him to move. But I understand that he has given me the spirit of God. He has given me every spiritual tool that I need to be successful in this life. And so I'm not just going to ask. I am going to declare because I believe God is for me, that the power of the Holy Spirit is in me, that his word is alive. And when I speak it out, there's no demon in heaven that can stop God's perfect will from coming to pass in your life. Now, I need, to, I need to clarify. I need to clarify. This isn't like a, you know, we're just twisting the arm of God and making him do what we want. Can I say this? God is sovereign. God is in control. And if it's not his will, you can declare until you're blue in the face and that thing's just not going to happen. However, if you are declaring, especially the word of God, and it aligns with his will, you can declare, and there is nothing on heaven or earth or below that can get in the way or stop the perfect plan of God from happening in response to your declaration. This is a different kind of prayer. It's not just, you know, oh Lord, you know, bless me, protect. No, it's saying, like James says in 5.16, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. In other words, the passionate, red-hot declaration word of a righteous person gets stuff done. Do you see the difference? I, I want to be a church that's not just cold, we're not lukewarm, but we're red-hot. And we're saying, listen, we believe so much in the promises of God. We have faith that he has given us authority on the earth that we can speak out. It's not a name it and claim it strategy. It's not a, well, Lord, give me that Lamborghini. I declare it's mine in Jesus' name. Look, if God wants you to have a Lamborghini, that'll work. For most of us, he doesn't want us to have a Lamborghini. I've seen how you drive. You're not doing so good in the Corolla. You know what I'm saying? Like, slow down. <laughs> 
But he wants us to understand that he has given us power to change things. In Ephesians chapter 3, the Bible says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with what? Power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. This is Paul writing. He's saying, I pray that out of the glorious riches of God, he would strengthen us with power. That's the Greek word dunamis, which is our English word dynamite. He wants us to have some explosive, dynamic power from his glorious riches. Have you ever thought of this? God is gloriously rich. He has created the universe. He owns the entire earth and the cattle and the cities and all the wealth and the resources. He owns it all. And he sits in heaven. He's saying, I am a good, good father. I want to provide for my kids. He wants us to be not impoverished children, but to be heirs of his kingdom. And the way that we see some of this come into our lives is by believing so much that we're not just asking, we're declaring. In Philippians 4, it says, God is able to meet all of our needs through his glorious riches. Praise be to God who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. We have a spiritually rich father, guys. And he doesn't want you to suffer through life as impoverished children. He wants to give you every thing you need. He wants you to be strengthened with power so you can pray some faith-filled prayers to get some stuff done. Are you with me? There are some Christians who think out there that it is better for us to kind of suffer and just sacrifice and live in a life of poverty. And I'm not even talking about finances. I'm talking about this mentality and this, this lack and this small mindedness. And can I tell you, that's a lie from the pit of hell that has creeped into the church so that the sons and daughters of God are not living to their full potential and not seeing the change that God wants to do on the earth. The Bible says that the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. There are some people who are not righteous who have wealth. Anybody know those people? We don't have to say any names. We're just going to leave it right there. God wants the people with the wealth and the influence and the power to be righteous people. Who's the righteous? Those who have called and confessed the name of Jesus. Those who are following him and trying to do his will. He wants you and I to be the change makers. He wants the church of Jesus Christ to be the most influential change agent on planet Earth. Jesus said, hey, you're a city on a hill. People look up to cities on hills. He says, let your light shine before men. Don't put it under. You got to let it put it out there to shine. We need to change the way we pray, guys. It's not just about pleading and begging. It's about saying, God, I understand you have given me authority. You have given me your word, and we can declare the change. For some of you, this might rub you the wrong way. There are ministries that have ran with this principle, and if you run with any set of doctrine to the nth degree, you will find error, because God is a God of balance. And as I said earlier, he is sovereign and he is in control. So it's not about name it and claim it and I declare this word and so it's going to happen. No, it has to align with God's will. And we are about teaching God's word in balance, I believe, the way he intended. But too many of us err on the other side. Well, we're not declaring anything. <laughs> we're not declaring the promises of God. We're not declaring change in our life. If we pray, we're praying small and not specific, just general prayers, and it's just not getting stuff done. Can I tell you, this may be the missing ingredient to your prayers, that you're not declaring a thing. You're not proclaiming the word of God, speaking out loud in your life. If you want the power to change things this year and start the decade right, maybe this is what God wants you to add into your tool belt. Uh, the last couple of weeks we've been talking about, you know, the beginning of every year, I've been challenging you the last couple of years to come up with one word. One word, pray and say, God, what is it the thing you want me to focus on? And uh, last week I shared, God gave me the word fulfillment which I like, you know, sometimes the words are a little like, ooh, that sounds challenging. That's a good one. So I'm like, yes, Lord, let's do that. And uh, <laughs> today, if you got a word, I'm going to ask you to take it a step further and find a scripture in the Bible, if you haven't already, that aligns with that word so that you can pray and declare that thing over your entire year. I got mine. When you want to hear it? Proverbs 13, 12. Well, you're going to hear it anyway. So here it comes. Proverbs 13, 12 says, Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but desire fulfilled is a tree of life. 
Isn't that good? So my prayer for this year is, God, I thank you that hope deferred makes a heart sick. But when desire is fulfilled, it's a tree of life. What is a tree of life? That means it's not just for me. It's not just God's going to answer and fulfill promises for my life. But I would be a tree of life that is providing fruit and uh, multiplication and growth and blessing and outpouring into other people, making a positive impact in my world. I thank God that Proverbs 13, 12 is going to be true in the year 2020. I wonder if you have a verse. There's asking God to do it, and that's good. And then there's understanding that God has given you power so that you can declare the change. God wants you to have power to overcome temptation. He wants you to have power to stand strong in the face of adversity. He wants you to have power to be bold and share Jesus in a dark situation, in a dark setting. He wants you to have power to... Do the thing for which he has created you to do. How many of you know you can't do it without him? You can do your plans and your goals without him, but you can't do anything of eternal value. You can't do what he has called and created you to do without him empowering you to do so. Here's some real practical things. God wants us to have power to forgive. There are people that have wronged you, and you think, I'll forgive when they ask. Or all forgive when they deserve it, when I feel like it. <laughs> Aren't you glad that God didn't treat us that way? That he forgave us when we were dead in our trespasses. He sent his only son to live a sinless life, to die on a cross, and to defeat death and raise from the grave when we didn't deserve it. So that all we have to do is accept the free gift of salvation. And he says, freely you've received, now freely forgive. That takes the power of God. He wants you to have power to remain calm in a chaotic storm. That's some supernatural power. He wants you to have power to be confident to step out in faith. Power to have that supernatural peace when you lay your head at night and you're worried about your problems, about your finances, about the relationship, the kids, the doctor's prognosis, the things that shake our core. God wants to give you power to have supernatural peace in the middle of all of that. He wants you to have power to have faith to believe that despite your current circumstances, that God is still good, that he is still for you, that this too will pass, and he has a plan and a future and a hope for you. God wants to give us this inner power. The Bible says outwardly we're wasting away. Every year I count a little bit more gray hair on here. I don't know what's going on, guys. Way too young for that to be happening. Gravity is taking its toll. Gravity. Anyway. Outwardly, we're wasting away, but inwardly, the Bible says we're being renewed day by day. Look how Ephesians 3.17 puts it. I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have, say it with me, power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Wow. One of the best prayers you can pray for your kids or for your, your spouse or people that you love is that they would have spiritual power. Because when you have that spiritual power on the inside of you, you can tackle and take on anything the world throws at you. To, to pray for not just spiritual power, but a fresh revelation of how much God loves them. That you can't know how much he loves us naturally, but supernaturally through the power of the Holy Spirit, it is revealed to us that God it doesn't just love us, but he is love. That it's coming at you no matter what you do, no matter what your past says, no matter what sin you struggle with, no matter what your church attendance is or the lack thereof, no matter what kind of you know, lifestyle you're in that you know you shouldn't be, the things that inwardly you look at the mirror and you go, gosh, why do I still do that? God loves you anyways. And if you place your faith in Jesus, the Holy Spirit dwells within you. I thought about how I could illustrate this. And, uh, you know, in America, there's certain codes. For those of you who are into building, they build houses. And all these houses, of course, are wired with electricity. There's breaker boxes, and you have different outlets going on. And if you're a Christian, you are in the family of God, in the house. In fact, Jesus said, where I'm going, I'm going to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house, there are many rooms. So literally, you have a room in heaven, perhaps a house, some translations say, and it is wired with power. Hmm. But a lot of us in our Christian life, we're walking around the house in the dark. 
And we're asking God to do things. And we're praying. And we're like, God, how come my life hasn't lined up with what I thought it would? I, I'm, I thought I'd be further along than I am right now. I, I thought that you would, you know, provide in this specific situation and you didn't. I thought you would heal at this and you didn't. And he's saying, you've got the power, it's running in the walls. It's connected to the outlets. Instead of walking around in the dark, you need to tap in to the power. How do we tap into the power of God? We need to learn this key fundamental to our prayers that we don't just ask. We can declare and see some change. We can speak out the word of God in our situation and watch him move. Jesus said, I want you to speak about your mountain. Right? That was a trick question. Nobody, okay. So he said, I want you to speak to your mountain. He said, if you have faith the size of a what? A mustard seed, just a little bit of faith. Speak to your mountain. Now that seems kind of weird. What do you mean speak? I'm going to speak to an inanimate object and expect some change. Yes. God said there's something that happens on your inside, something that happens with your spirit. When you take what you believe inwardly and declare it outwardly, something starts to change in the atmosphere. Now, it's difficult for a lot of us because it's not physical. You don't see it with your natural eye. But what Jesus was teaching is that you've got to declare out the word of God. Speak to your problems. You know what most of us are good at? Speaking about our problems. Huh? Right? We speak about our problems, and then we speak about our problems again, and then we got to tell some other people about our problems. And you know what you're doing? You're just constantly reminding yourself and rehashing instead of declaring faith to change that thing. Guess what? It ain't going to change if you just keep talking about it. You know what's going to cause change? When you start declaring God's word over it. When you take some authority over it in Jesus' name. When you put God's word to the test like Jesus taught us to. James 5 one of my all-time favorite passages of scripture, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And guess what? It didn't. It did not rain on the land for three years and six months, and he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. The Bible is saying this. Elijah did some amazing things in his life, but guess what? He wasn't special. He was a guy just like us. He had a nature just like us, but he understood there are some different kind of prayers. He didn't just ask God, Lord, would you please stop the rain? Let me prove it to you. In 1 Kings 17, this is what James 5 is referring to. Now, Elijah, the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. You see the difference there? He's not saying, Lord, would you please do this? He says, no, it's not going to rain at my word. Now, that aligned with God's perfect will. I believe he heard from God and the Holy Spirit gave him the ability to speak that out, but it came true. And then if we look at the next chapter in 1 Kings 18, there's an important principle I want to close with. It says, Elijah said to Ahab, go eat and drink, for there is the sound of a heavy rain. Uh, mind you, it still wasn't raining. So Ahab went off to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of Carmel, bent down to the ground and put his face between his knees. Go and look toward the sea, he told his servant, and he went up and looked. There's nothing there, he said. Seven times, Elijah said, go back. The seventh time, the servant reported, a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising from the sea. So Elijah said, go and tell Ahab, hitch up your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Meanwhile, the sky grew black with clouds. The wind rose, a heavy rain started falling, and Ahab rode off to Jezreel. The power of the Lord came on Elijah, and tucking his cloak into his belt, he ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. It's a really cool story right at the end there. He got some supernatural sprinting speed, and he's running like Usain Bolt. But he... he was praying and praying and praying and praying and still didn't have the answer. Notice that he said in faith, there is the sound of heavy rain. There was no rain. But in faith, he was saying, I am declaring a thing. I am in my spiritual eye seeing rain come into existence. And then he went down on his knees and he prayed. The Bible doesn't tell us exactly what he prayed. But based on his first prayer where he says, there ain't going to be rain, guys, and there wasn't, I would, I would guess that he is not just saying, all right, God, now's the time. Please, will you do this? Please, please, will you send rain. Let them know that I'm the man of God, that I'm the prophet. Like, show, show these people. I don't think so. I don't think he was pleading and contending with God. I think he was declaring it to be so. 
he was saying, there is going to be rain. I can hear it. Now go check. Nothing. Okay, go check again. Nothing. Okay, go check again. Nothing. Okay, go check again. Nothing. Okay, check again. Nothing. Okay, check again. Nothing. Okay, check one more time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tiny little clouds coming up. He's like, you better hurry. <laughs> There's some rain coming. Can you imagine the thought his servant might have had? Like, really? <laughs> that little tiny cloud? Yeah, I'll hurry. All right. <laughs> I got my rain boots on. <laughs> like, I'm really worried. But Elijah had such faith. He declared things into existence. And it's easy to read that story. And I go, man, that guy was awesome. Wow, whew, amazing. God used him in powerful ways. Let me remind you, James 5, 17. Elijah was a man with a nature just like ours. In other words, you can do this too. God has given power to his kids. And I want to help you unlock that, ignite that, remind you that you are not just like everybody else. You don't just have to go through life and take everything that comes at you. You can actually cause some change in your world. You have a, a, a God who loves you so much that he died for you and he put the Holy Spirit of God living within you. You have access to an unlimited power source, a dunamis power source that wants to show up and show off in your life. God wants you to get to a place where sure you're asking him for things. The Bible says pray without ceasing and bring our petitions to him. But he wants us to get to a place in our trust in him where we go, I don't have to ask God to do this. I know he wants this to be done. And so in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, I declare this will happen in Jesus' name. He wants us to grow in our understanding of what he has given us and what he has called us to do. I would suggest our prayers are too general. They're too small. And God wants us to declare some big things this year. Amen. He wants us to declare some change into our life. And I'll close with this verse, Ephesians 3.20, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. I don't know if you ever thought about this. This kind of jumped out at me this week. Where does God's power live? I would think in heaven, right? God is in heaven, and he's got all power, and we just sometimes we kind of ask him, Lord, you have power. Will you move? Will you do this? Will you intervene in my life? The Bible says right here in Ephesians 3 that the power is at work within us, that it's not distant, it's not in heaven only, but that God is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or even imagine according to the power that is at work in you. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is in you. The same God who rose Jesus Christ from the grave lives within you. Don't walk around the house with the lights off. I'm telling you in 2020, it's time to turn the lights on. It's time to plug some things into the outlets. It's time to stop just asking God that he would move, but understand he's given us power and authority so that we can declare and that we can move. But let me warn you, if you ask God for a harvest, he might just give you a shovel. <laughs> if you ask God for healing in your life, he might just send you on a path where you, you start learning some different habits and lifestyles. If you start asking God for provision, he might give you a, a, a business opportunity or, or a, a side hustle or a second job to provide. Are you with me? The things that we ask God for, we often think like, God, you do it. And God would say, I've given you the power to do it. <laughs> it's not just a sit back and watch God move situation. No, he partners with us. He chooses to wait for us <laughs> that we would respond in faith, that we would step out. And I know that for a lot of you, this is a different thought process, a different idea. You're like, yeah, it sounds kind of sounds weird, Josh. Maybe just open your heart. Maybe God's wanting you to stand and declare some things. If not, if this isn't from God, it doesn't resonate with your spirit, then move on. We'll be on a different topic next week. But I believe God wants us to declare some things into existence. I believe he wants us to see the change by making the change. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word, that it is alive and it is active. 
God, I pray that you would ignite some things in our hearts this morning. God, I know that we all come in here with our, our problems and our stresses. But Lord, would you illuminate the things in our lives that you've been wanting us to learn, to, to not just ask you, to not just wait for you to do it, but God, what things are you wanting us to declare the change in? What things are you wanting us to speak to the mountain and watch it be moved so that you get all the glory? Lord, I pray that our faith would be ignited in this place, that our hope would be refilled, and that we would walk out of here with a sense of boldness and courage to not just ask and kind of beg, but to stand on your word and declare things into existence. We know that you watch over your word to make sure it does exactly what you want it to accomplish. So God, this morning, we stand here as your children, full of faith, believing you have good plans for us, believing that you watch over your word. And we declare that this year will be blessed in Jesus' name. Not that it'll be perfect or problem free, but that no matter what problems come our way, you will bring a greater purpose to fruition in our lives. Lord, we declare that you are good. You are still for us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.